So let's go into the second video on how to conduct psychological research. So we started to talk about uh, in class about case studies. Case studies are used in a lot of things, but especially psychology. A case study is in psychology refers to the use of a descriptive research approach to obtain an in-depth analysis of a person, group, or phenomenon. So case studies are kind of like almost like documentaries, except you're the documentarian. You're the one interviewing them if you're a researcher. And you're getting all this information through interviews and meeting with the person, and you're watching and talking to them however long the study goes on for. So you've probably seen a lot of case studies, on, uh, unfortunately, on things like murders or something on criminal shows or crime shows. Um, but in psychology, we'll do case studies on people with ADHD. We'll do case studies on people with schizophrenia. We'll do case studies with people that um, are delusional or even case studies on somebody that is starting to have onset of dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And that's in medicine as well. Case studies look at one person or, and they, or a group and they, they go and try to figure out what's going on. It's a lot of empirical data, meaning a lot of observation. We keep using this term empiricalism. Empiricalism is learning through observation. So as you can see with the Hawthorne effect, one of the challenges of uh, doing a case study is bias. Researchers bring their bias in there. So the person that's interviewing them and watching them is going to bring their bias in. That's why in psychology and abnormal psychology, we talk about things like uh, multiple personality disorder. It's actually not called that. This associated uh, personality disorder is the real name. And you guys have seen these movies where somebody's like three or four personalities. And there's actually quite a bit of controversy in psychology on whether this really exists. Because one of the problems would be if you're doing a case study on somebody with disassociated personality disorder or multi-personality disorder, if you believe in it, you're probably going to bring your bias into it and want it to be real. And this is a big deal because there's not too many people have actually fallen into this category. On the other side of it, if you don't believe in it, you're probably going to try to disprove it. And you're going to look for things that show, eh, it's not really disassociated personality disorder. And that's something we really talk in Psych 2 about abnormal psychology. Now, techniques they employ, including, here's some of the techniques, personal interviews. So we interview the person. We watch them. I think personality, uh, disassociated personality disorder is a good one. I've actually seen it done at the psychiatric uh, ward. I can't t say any more than that, where psychiatrists would come in. They would interview the person. They would watch them. Then they would do some testing that I'm not, I haven't seen but they would do some kind of testing or evaluation using, you know, where do they see maybe something like how out of control is their reality? Why do they think there's more than one personality? Uh, and then archived records. So you'll look up records on things that people have done in the past. Well, if they're coming in for uh, disassociated personality disorder or multi multiple personalities, as you guys have probably heard it called, is there evidence that this has come on? Has this come on in childhood? Did it come on with abuse? We're trying to find a record. Oh, their parent was abusive. Well, maybe there's some kind of link there. So we're looking at all these records and indications. So case studies are very important. They're not used just for disassociated personality disorder. It could be done for anything, ADHD, um, all kinds of things. And also, yes, you guys see this a lot in Criminal Minds and these TV shows where they, people are obsessed with serial killers and stuff. Um, that's actually not very interesting to me. But there's a lot of psychologists that are very interested in uh, the difference between, you know, um, people that have these brain issues and maybe, you know, they socially choose to hurt people. Now, the survey method, scientists use the survey method to interview people by distributing questionnaires. While this is becoming easier and easier and cheaper and cheaper, we're also getting better at doing it, meaning now we know, hey, you should probably do it on a team. Chances are if one person's doing it, the questions might not work out very well. And let's go over on how you set up good questions. Scientists have to choose people they survey carefully, first and foremost. So if we're looking at something like um, ADHD, we're trying to find out when does that come on? We see more and more ADHD in children and high school students. Uh, however, we've actually seen that people lose ADHD when they get older. So does it have some kind of uh, aging out or does it become easier to just deal with when you're older? And what is ADHD? Is it, it's a very interesting question. Is it the inability to pay attention, focus on one thing at a time? 
What's causing it? Is it apps? We've seen TV, for example. Researchers said if you watch a lot of TV, uh, especially for the age of three, that can cause higher rates of ADHD in children and students. And, uh, you know, that makes sense. Your brain is processing and most of its developing is done before the age of five. So you would have to interview uh, young children and you'd have to interview uh, people about this subject. Also, the kind of the kings and queens of using the survey method in psychology, believe it or not, is politicians. Politicians hire psychologists to do research and the best people that do research on uh, for them is like polls. If they do really good polls, uh, that could actually tell them a lot of information on what their constituents or the people that live in their district want and they want to figure out how to get elected or keep people happy. So politicians and politics is a very, very much a lot of psychology. It's understanding human behavior and telling people what they want to hear or making sure they make choices based on what people want in their area. And this and the uh, the p political scientists, which are using scientific uh, psychological methods that are good at this, help their clients or the, the people are running for Republicans or Democrats or whatever party do much better if they are up on their polls and the data. Well, the data you're getting is, hey, what do you guys want? Now, the challenge with the survey method is that people may not be honest about their attitudes or behavior. People may limit their response for private reasons. People may say what they want or think the interviewer wants to hear. That's a big problem. People might just blow it off. Here's the good news. If you do a valid psychological research survey, yes, you will have error, but you could limit the error to maybe one or 2%. That's not much. So we have a very good idea about how people feel about a certain subject in a certain area or a certain demographic. And demographics mean male, female, age groups, where they live geographically, their ancestry, how they see themselves uh, racially, do they see themselves as black or white? All these things matter and how people perceive things and their attitude towards things. And we can survey you people and get pretty close. Just like we saw, um, just based on a short survey you guys took with the University of Harvard, Harvard University, you guys saw that they had basically come down to about 40 questions and they could pretty much locate where you live in the United States based on the way you speak and you answer certain very, very specific questions that tell them information like what region of the United States you're in and uh, why you're saying that. But also, it doesn't calculate that you might have influence from other regions. So for example, if you're in Wisconsin or Minnesota, my friends and family say pop. You guys want a couple pops? That's a soda. In St. Louis, we call it soda. You go to the south, especially around Georgia, you're gonna hear Coke. Give me a Coke. What kind of Coke do you want? A root beer. Coke means soda. So the reason we know this is because we've done research and surveyed and most people in the area call it Coke in the South. Most people in the, nor in the Northern mid uh, Midwest call it pop. And then people in the Missouri and kind of in the center where we're at, they call it soda. So how do social scientists conduct survey questions? This is very important. How do you conduct very well uh, accurate questions we're about to get to? First of all, you have to have a target population. It's a group of people that want to study or describe, okay? So first of all, just like a hypothesis, you have to establish your, your thesis or, your, or what you think is going to happen if you do this experiment. With the survey, what group are we specifically trying to understand? You can't understand everybody all the time. But we, the more specific we get, then we establish what's called a sample. A sample is a difficult interview or everybody questions everybody. So you want to target just a small group. That's realistic. And believe it or not, for example, when we do polls, you might only need a couple thousand people to get the poll within less than 5% margin of error, which means it could, they could be 5% low or 5% high. So for example, with the uh, election in uh, 2016, when Donald Trump won, people are like, what? They, no way, there's no way he could win. It went against all the polls. Nobody said he could win. That's not true. The polls are very accurate. They had a 5% error. So there was 5% chance that he could come up. And with those errors factor in, the polls were right on. Just because people perceive it as right on, they were in the margin of error. So surveys tend to be very, and polls can be very accurate if they're done correctly. And we'll talk about how you actually do this correctly. A sample is only a part of the target population. So 
For example, if we were doing people with mental health issues, let's do uh, people with mental health issues. Well, that's only about 22% of Americans. So that's a little, little over one out of five, less than one in four Americans have mental health issues, okay? Say we want to survey them about um, how mental health care, how accessible mental health care is in America. Okay, that's our question that we have to look at. Our group is going to be mental health, people with mental health issues. And then we have to look at people in America. That's a very vast region. It'd be easier to just look at St. Louis. Now, social scientist orders for the service to, accurate, to get an accurate depiction of what is called a random sample. They will want a stratified sample. So the way you get this accurate is you have to randomize it. You're going to reach out to all kinds of people, and you're going to try to find people with mental health issues. Okay, And that actually could be easier because we could give them the survey at a mental health uh, institution, and we know they have a mental health issue because they're going to a psychologist. Okay. Now, there's some problems even with that survey. You're only getting people that are actually getting mental health and asking them questions about their men the mental health system. The problem would be how do we talk to people that do not get mental health and how they perceive mental health system. That would be difficult, though, because maybe they've never been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Maybe they've never been diagnosed with depression or um, bipolar disorder or uh, all kinds of uh, mental health issues that we need to understand. So that's the problem with the survey, would be, it'd be limited on who we could talk to. But in America, for example, if the question was about American random or health, we'd have to randomize the questions or randomize where we question people all across America. We need to get people from the Midwest. We need to get people from the Northeast, to get people from the South, the Southwest, the West Coast, and even the Northwest. They might answer questions differently. We need to get all different types of group of people within that. We need to get uh, African Americans. We need to get Latinx Americans. We need to get white Americans. We need to get people all different backgrounds. We need to get males. We need to get females. We need to get people that are uh, that are non-binary. They don't see themselves as male or female. That stuff could all matter, uh, depending on the questions we're asking. Now, a stratified sample is consisted of a. Uh, it's like a subgroup of a population. So you're going even deeper. So if we wanted to look at non-binary people and their access to mental health in America, that would be an even deeper group we have to go into. And those would be maybe easier in some ways, again, to find people to survey because we could find out um, people that meet with psychologists or, and ask them uh, if they would take the survey. However, again, uh, people that are non-binary that don't meet with the psychologist, we wouldn't get any answers from a question. So that would be some of the issues. If we did a random phone calls that's one way we do this that could be very expensive though we'd have to pay people to ask the questions on the phone and also they could bring their bias they could start asking the questions in a way that's throwing the people off that's why it's almost better to just have the questions digital or have the questions on paper because if i say something to you a certain way it makes it more likely for you to remember it just like when i teach and i make an example but also if i ask a question in certain ways you'll find out in the next slide it can actually make you want to say certain answers. And the one thing above all is you got to make sure that it's anonymous, that anonymous, which means you can't ask their names. We don't want their names. When I survey my students at the end of a class, I don't ask names. So some kids will just, they'll be free. Now they're more likely to say something if they're unhappy, probably than if they're happy, but it's good feedback either way. There's things I can think about to always improve my class and my teaching.